Thank you so much for having me, um, all of you, Sad. Um, that was a fantastic introduction. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone that's watching. Um, it's a really tough time at the moment, isn't it? So I hope you're all doing okay. A lot of uncertainty. Um, so where do I start with myself? I think I'm going to start where I am now and then take it back to when I was younger. So Em gave me a really wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a broadcaster across uh, TV and radio, but I've kind of maneuvered my career slightly a little bit. So I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, but I do a lot of campaigning. And as Em mentioned, I sit on a Ministry of Justice panel and advise the government around issues of sexual and domestic abuse. Um, I'm working with the uh, Centre for Social Justice on a very big project around child uh, sexual exploitation and child sexual abuse. And so I do a lot of work in that area as well and around uh, mental health. Um, I have a podcast which speaks to sports stars about mental health and it's going really well. It's been fantastic. I was featured by Apple. And also um, I created a series around domestic abuse. I did an investigative series last year called Undiscussable. Um, which followed the journey and had a challenging rethinking around domestic abuse. And then now I actually got the series commissioned uh, for talk radio. So it's been an eight part special series uh, looking at healthy relationships, education and um, domestic abuse, um, like gender stereotyping. And um, so I suppose that's where I am right now. Although actually I was meant to be in Tokyo right now. <laughs> working on the Olympics so but I'm not I'm sat in my home talking to you uh, which is fantastic so I think that's a, a real nutshell of, of where I am now some of the things that I've done um, and I'm going to go back I almost want you to hear some of the things that I've done now and then and then show you what my life was like as a young person um, so I was the first woman in Asia to host um, sport um, so I moved to Asia, I was scouted to move to Asia when I was like 23 years old and I was so young and inexperienced and um, it was really difficult because at the time only men really worked in that area and I think things have changed a lot um, even though I think there still can be some prejudices and so it was really big when I became the first woman to host sport um, over there, live sport um, and then I also became the first woman in the world um, to work on boxing and to host live boxing and host a heavyweight world title fight. Um, so I've done a few firsts in that area. Um, I also do a lot of competition um, where I run, I don't know if you've heard of Ironman Triathlon. Um, and also I did a big, big challenge where I ran 250 miles down the country and I actually got honoured in Parliament uh, for doing that because I was raising uh, money for women's aid and we were talking about uh, domestic abuse and then four years ago I four years ago now actually I cycled from London to Rio I cycled 3,000 miles which sounds completely crazy I know um, for five weeks and I think we completed it in just under five weeks and got there in time for the Olympics and um, so I've done quite a lot of challenges lots of different marathons as well and um, have won various different accolades um, but actually where I'm from, when I was younger, um, I'm from Sheffield. I don't know whether anybody even know it in Yorkshire. And um, I actually um, was brought up in quite a difficult background. Um, so my mum had me when she was a teenager. Very, very proud of my mum, but things were very difficult for her, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, she, she was a 16 year old mum <laughs> with me. And um, it was very frowned upon then as well. And um, we didn't we didn't have any money. Um, I don't come from a, a background of pe well connected people or, or money or anything. And then um, I was brought up in a household of domestic abuse as well. And um, so there's a lot of very unhealthy relationships. I used to feel very scared, and um, it was really horrible watching my mum so upset all the time. And um, a lot of things were done to me in the home as well. So. I didn't really like being at home. I didn't really have a safe space at home. And I used to spend a lot of time just outside. Um, and then by the time I think I was in my early teenage years, um, I felt very low. I felt very depressed. Um, I used to self-harm and um, just felt very lonely and like that I wasn't very good and I wasn't good enough. And I think I felt very worthless. And then um, I found 
running and I went like and I ran basically and I joined a running group and it became like my family and my safe space and my savior and it was amazing and I had amazing friends um but then um, my running coach um saw I think how vulnerable I was and took advantage of that and actually um ended up I mean I'm sure you've heard of grooming and understand what grooming behavior is um and my coach used to say to me that I was really amazing and I was really good and I used to win races and I was representing my city and my county and um north of England and then I went to the nationals as well but at the same time my coach was actually sexually abusing me and it was very very confusing at that time because I didn't have a very safe home life I didn't have many people I could turn to and um, like I said, I think I felt very lonely and very confused in that. And I felt like I couldn't speak out or I didn't really understand what a normal relationship was or what a healthy relationship was, or I felt like it was very much my fault. And I felt like, well, maybe I, maybe I deserve it because I'm not good enough. And I think then I had this like pattern in my head of feeling that if only I was better, if only I was cleverer, if only I looked better, if only I could achieve this, if only I was from a better background, um, if only I had some money, you know, all these things that I felt like I was never, never good enough. So um, I, I, you know, I basically went to live with my uh, nan and granddad, um, which was a more positive environment, but at the same time, I felt very sad and very lonely because I felt disconnected from my family and then I at that period I was like okay there's got to be something more for me but in the area in the school I went to it was very much like I was written off so I went to the same school that my mum went to and a lot of people thought oh well she's the the child of the child that fell pregnant so I think I was very typecast in that sense and because I was from a very poor household um, I, you know I was on free school meals and um, I was very aware that I wasn't I, I wasn't privileged I didn't have things like some of the other um, kids did and like I said I didn't I didn't feel like I had a lot of love or a lot of support but I worked really really hard because I decided well you know I, d I don't want to run because of what was happening to me and um, even though I felt like I wanted to be a professional athlete but then I was like right there's got to be something I've got, there's got to be something that I can do in my life. Like I've, I, I feel like this, this isn't, you know, just my life. So a few people said, oh, why don't I try to go to university? And I was like, what? I can't go to university. I don't have any money. I'm not from that kind of background. You know, I'm from a poor place in Sheffield and, and I have, I don't have family support. <laughs> so, you know, what, how am I supposed to even get there? And then I was like, well, I'm just going to apply because I've got nowhere to live anyway. So I might as well try and apply for university. And I did apply for university. And again, I didn't think I was good enough, but I got in and I was like, oh my gosh. So nobody in my family um, had been educated or ever been to university or gone into higher education. Um, all my family left at 16. And that was the kind of history of my family. So when I got into university, again, I thought, oh, well, I've got the place, but I'm still not clever enough. I'm not good enough. Um, I, don't think, I don't think I should go, but then I didn't really have anywhere to go because I didn't have a family home. So I ended up going to university and it was the best thing I ever did. And, but when I got there, I, sometimes I was like, who are these people? Because everybody spoke really posh and I'd never heard like a middle-class standard RP accent in my life or a different accent from mine. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I felt so out of place. I felt like all these people were better than me. But I was like, well, if I work really hard, then, you know, maybe I can try and get a degree. And my confidence just grew when I realized, oh, hang on a second. Like I'm actually getting good marks. I can do this. But I worked full time as well when I was at university to try and financially support myself because I wasn't financially supported and um, so I didn't have a grant and I didn't have um, family paying for my degree so I worked full-time in a gym as a I got qualified um, as a personal trainer because I was like I need a skill so I went on this course to 
to and I loved sport and I know so much about sport because of all the running competitions that I'd done as a teenager so I got qualified as a fitness instructor and as a personal trainer and then worked in a gym as an 18 year old training teaching classes and then I'd teach a class in my sweaty gym gear and then I'd go to a lecture <laughs> and sit in a lecture you know and everybody else had just got up um, you know, they'd been in bed till 11 o'clock, whereas I'd been teaching from six o'clock in the morning. And then I sat in my lecture and then I went straight back to the gym, still in my sweaty tracksuit and then taught another class, a lunchtime class, and then went back to my lectures. And, and that was my university life, I suppose. But then I started to make some amazing friends. Um, and, and I just was like, oh my gosh, like I'm in control of my life. I can earn money. I can, uh, you know, I can support myself um, I can, you know, I'm doing my education. I'm going to get a degree. I've got friends. And it was like a really turning, a real amazing turning point for me because it gave me so much sense of achievement. And then that's when I went on to, to work in my career. So I got, gradu I graduated, I got my degree and um, I still had very low self-esteem, but I moved to London because I was very much like, I think because of my background, I was very risk taker because I'd got nothing to lose, you know, I, nothing could be worse from some of the things that happened to me. So I just moved to London and I just, I had no contacts, I had no money and I just got a job in a gym um, and then tried to sign up to different agencies and try to get as much experience as possible. And then after my degree, I signed up to a course to do journalism. So um I worked on that and I think I just was so determined to try and create a life that was so different from what I knew and I think we often get we often feel um, especially when we're younger it's definitely something that I felt that I didn't belong there and I you know because of where I was from and because of everything that happened to me that I didn't belong in a place where I could achieve or you know I wasn't like these people that were amazing and could make do all these achievements and 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 be successful and independent and change and make change and but then I started to to when I started to get into TV so I actually um, got my first job in television when I was 21 years old and um, I think over a thousand people went up for the job and I remember walking into the room. Um, and I saw all these people. I mean, there wasn't a thousand people there, but there was a couple of hundred when I went. And then I think it was staggered. And I was like, oh no, oh no. Everybody was wearing a suit. Everybody was much older than me. Nearly everybody in the room was male. And I walked in as a 21 year old and I had like ripped jeans on and a t shirt. And I'm very tall and five foot 10. Um, and my hair's very long. It was even longer than this and a little bit blonder. And I was like, oh no, like, I'm just not good enough to go for this job. But then I was like, quite stubborn and quite feisty. And I was like, well, I don't care about these people. I'm just going to go for the job anyway. And I could have just walked away and was like, oh no, this is not for me. And these people are all better than me. But I was like, no, I'm going to sit here and go up for this job. And if I don't get it, I don't get it. But if I don't try, then I never know. And um, I ended up getting the job out of a thousand people over a thousand people and that was my first television job um, actually presenting football and I think what it made me start to realize was that I didn't need to look a certain way um, and because I was always kind of paranoid about the way I look and people maybe think I was stupid or because of where I'm from or because of my accent and um, that maybe it sounds you know maybe people won't want to work with me um, but one of the things that it started to teach me was that why did I get that job? I got that job because I was friendly. I was enthusiastic. I was passionate. I was determined. I was dedicated. Um, I really wanted to work hard. And also I really knew my subjects. Like I knew football very well because from a very young age, I used to watch football. Um, I used to go to the games sometimes with my dad, even when my mom and dad got divorced. And, um, and, I used to play football at school and it was just sport was just something I was always interested in. And actually they didn't care that about some of the other things that I thought they would care about as in the fact that I wasn't wearing a suit or the fact that I was a woman. And they actually just 
that I asked them and they gave me the job because they really liked my enthusiasm and my passion and could see my potential, which, I, which started to teach me that, or maybe I do have some assets and skills that people will want to work with me on. And so from there, it really helped me build my confidence. And then that's when I, I worked very, very hard. And um, I think I felt like I had a lot to prove. Um, and then, then from then on is when I got scouted to go to Asia and became the first woman in Asia and then um, to present sport. And then I moved back to England and then I worked in Formula One. I did World Cups. I did Champions Leagues. I did two Olympics. I did Wimbledon. And I think I just grew in confidence. And every time I was like, um, oh, like st still, even when I worked at Sky, I thought, oh, you know, I'm from a very different background from these people. I'm a very different type of person. Um, I'm, you know, a very deep person. And, at the, at, you know, and also I had a lot of trauma and I also live with depression. And, and I think it's something that I felt, I felt very different from the people that I worked with. But then I was like, but actually the difference I can bring is a is a real asset and is a real positivity and i think in any area in any career in any job if we're all the same and we're like other people then we won't be able to bring differences so for example like a woman um in in a room with all men the woman could probably bring a really different thought process or a different you know it's not about it's about i think having both sets of different types of people in the room and that's what i started to realize and even now in some of the work I do, the project I do where I um, speak to sports stars around mental health, I'm like, oh, hang on a second. Like I can do this and I can speak to people because I've, I've experienced that myself. Like I understand what it's like to feel low and to be in dark places and to have depression. And those are the things that maybe people will, that, that's why I can actually do that job and do that role. But then um, I, you know, I did very well in my career and, and, but then when at the very beginning, do you remember I told you that um, like one of the things I want to talk about was one of the biggest challenges in my life. I had a lot of challenges when I was younger, um, as you've heard, and um, it took me a long time to really grow my self-esteem. But then I think there's another part as well. It took me a long time to really grow my worth inside. So I think you can build your confidence in your self-esteem. But then I still had this voice that told me that I wasn't good enough all the time. And it told me to work harder and to push harder. And every time I achieved something, it was almost never good enough because it was like, oh, well, I achieved that, but then I need to go to the next thing and the next thing. And um, I think one of the things I really worked on was to try and to try and appreciate what I'd done and that I was good enough and I am good enough just the way I am, no matter what. The different achievements I have and what really taught me with that was one of the biggest challenges in my adult life was when I cycled to Rio I cycled 3,000 miles arrived in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil I was meant to be presenting on the Olympics I had so many different projects I was working on a big project in America with Facebook and Ryan Seacrest and I, and I had all these different things that incredible things I'd worked so hard to try and get and then um, I ended up in hospital and the next day after the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. And I was at the opening ceremony. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> and then the next day I had one of the biggest challenges ever in my life. And I was um, sent to hospital. And then the next day I ended up in a coma and I was actually on a life support machine and I was critically ill and I had multiple organ failure and multiple tropical diseases, including malaria and uh, and another one that I can't pronounce, um, anti-hemolytic uremic syndrome and Shigella and all these different, four different diseases I had, plus pneumonia. And um, the doctors actually said that I was, that I was dying. And um, that's what my family was told. And um, I knew that as well. So I was like, oh my gosh. And it was really interesting because in that moment, I didn't have any regrets or anything. I just wanted to live. I just wanted to do more. And then obviously I survived because I'm here and I'm not a ghost. <laughs> um, but I was in hospital for, two, for over two months. I was then um, repatriated back to England. And then, you know, I had more of my recovery. I mean, that's another, 
a whole other talk in itself. So I won't go into too much detail um, around that, maybe another time. And, um, but when I came out of hospital, I had to learn how to walk again. I couldn't walk. And this was only, this was coming up to four years ago. So it was four years ago in August. So it's quite, quite recent. And um, yeah, I had to learn how to walk again. Um, I had like brain hemorrhaging. So my words didn't come out right. Sometimes I couldn't see properly. I had all these different damaged things and I had kidney damage and I still have kidney damage now. Um, but I was almost at a crossroads where I felt like, oh my gosh, like what, what's happened to me? Who am I? Like after all these things I've fought for and I've worked for, and then this happened to me and I felt really low and, and I got diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. I was really depressed and loads of people were saying to me, you're so lucky to be alive. And I was like, yeah, I'm so lucky to be alive, but I feel so crap inside. And I felt so just down and, and confused and whether I could ever get my career back, um, you know, because I couldn't work. Um, and then everything that I was working on just disappeared. Um, all my contracts went and, and, but it was also about like what, how I actually felt inside. And I felt like I'd lost my identity. And so I went on some real soul searching. And what I also realized was that a lot of the stuff that happened to me when I was younger, I hadn't really dealt with. Um, so I went on this journey to, to try and heal a lot of the things that happened to me when I was younger. Um, and as part of that, I went and studied um, schema therapy for two years and went as part of a trauma group. And, um, and then I just had this amazing realization that even though I'd achieved so much and I'd worked so hard, it was so important that I didn't value myself on my achievements. So I actually valued me for me and that even if I didn't achieve that thing or I didn't get that job, that it was okay because I'm still good enough just as I am. And I think that was one of the biggest lessons. Um, and if I look back, I remember um, when I was looking to do this talk and I was talking to um, you know, some of the amazing people that are running uh, this, um, like what do I wish I knew back then? And I don't think I wish I knew anything when I was younger other than that I am good enough just as I am. Um, and I think that's the most important thing that we can ever learn and we can ever feel because I think it's really important. I know this series is called Break the Glass and I broke so much glass <laughs> and so many ceilings and I was so determined to because I think I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder because I felt like, you know, I felt like everybody else had was more privileged than me. <laughs> and um, I wanted to show that somebody like me and from my background and from a really, really troubled home life and that had, that had suffered a lot of trauma and abuse um, could be something and could get to where, to where I am now. Um, but I think one of the biggest lessons was in that I think I was doing it because I wanted to prove to everyone else, but I never really felt it myself. So I think that I tried to switch things and it was the biggest lesson I've ever learned. And that's one that through the challenge of being so ill, and having to really be stripped raw and it made me it made me kind of learn to heal and to love myself a lot more which i think is one of the most important things when we're trying to break the black glass and when we're trying to uh, strive because i think i was so hard on myself and i worked so hard and i wanted to achieve all these things was that my achievements are amazing but but i need to be able to feel good about who I am because otherwise I think sometimes you know we can do all these things and we can get an A but we think oh well I could have done better I could have done harder rather than being like no I worked really hard on this and um, I'm doing really well and also I think if we ever get a rejection or we don't get something which happens so much in my industry even now like where I am now sometimes you know I work for something and then it doesn't happen um, or I go, I work on a particular project and then it doesn't get a commission. That happened to me recently. Um, I was, um, wrote a project for a network. I didn't really say which one. And then it didn't, it, I thought it was going to get the commission. It didn't. And I was like, oh, this is so frustrating. And I think 
it's so important to learn how to take those knockbacks and remember that those knockbacks don't aren't personal and they don't mean that you aren't good enough. They can just be somebody's opinion or can they can just be down to budget or, or, you know, if you're applying for university, it can just be down to, you know, maybe that's not right for you or maybe it's just somebody's opinion. It doesn't mean that that person's opinion is, is to take, takes away your value from you. So that I think is one of the, the biggest things I've learned. And I have so many stories I can tell, but I think I, I think it's wrap up time for me to see if there's any questions. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening.